Hi, it's Mike Gillen, pastor at Cornerstone United Methodist Church. This is our Wednesday worship for Cornerstone's virtual ministries. This is my regular Wednesday Bible study. To those of you who are part of the regular Cornerstone community, good to see you. Hope you've found me tonight. Uh, always appreciate the patience of the Cornerstone regulars as we continue to figure out, especially as I have continued to figure out, how to do ministry in our virtual world. I really want to thank uh, some of the regular volunteer leaders and staff involved in the Cornerstone Virtual Ministries. Our video team made up of Bruce Wilson and Jay Deshawn and John Hodge are working with me every week to create the Sunday morning virtual ministries that I do and appreciate so much their hard work in recording and editing and getting all that ready and making me look better than I really am at doing virtual ministry. I also wanna thank uh, John Woodrum, our treasurer. We've begun to rapidly expand the way people can financially support the church through online and social media and uh, giving app opportunities. And John's been terrific working with Cornerstone folks who want to be able to give to Cornerstone through credit card, digital, electronic means. Appreciate so much John's uh, consistent, excellent work helping folks figure out what can be a very stressful thing related to money and giving to the church. I also wanna thank Karina McGlasson who has just been fantastic in helping us create these virtual ministries. During this pandemic, we have rapid, rapidly retooled our ministries and Karina is someone that we have seen transition from doing an assistant director's job in modern worship to also doing tremendous work in supporting the behind the scenes technical stuff that needs to happen in order for us to have high quality virtual ministry. Thanks so much, Karina and her hard work. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important for us to do during these virtual ministry opportunities is for us to pray. We've changed some of how we do prayers in the virtual world, especially with live events that are streamed without any kind of kind of uh, uh, protection of privacy to where we're just mentioning first names now. So they're much less personalized prayer requests than they might have been if we were in a sanctuary with people all together. In our uh, transition to more digital electronic ways of communicating, we have a Friday email newsletter called The Weekend Update. You can contact us at cornerstoneofallon.org, our website, and you can let us know that you want to be on that Friday email newsletter list. That'll also give you access to a Sunday morning recap of everything we do with Cornerstone Virtual Sunday. And that recap has links to all the different aspects of the Sunday worship experience. So you can rewatch specific songs, you can rewatch the message 10, 12, or 15 times, which I know you wanna do, and you'll be able to see other things too, but it's, it's a great way of, of seeing Cornerstone Virtual Sunday to get that recap email, which is all part of the Friday weekend update email list that we generate. But also we mentioned prayer requests in that Friday weekend update in greater detail. So I uh, hope you'll sign up for that weekend update email that you get. Uh, by the way, I want to mention that last Sunday, I was watching the virtual worship service and was watching as people were, were, were viewing the first half of the service for, that's all just for everybody. And then when it came to the Kids Jam, the children's ministry portion, which was re led by Rob Hunter last Sunday, I noticed a tremendous, like it halved, like half of the people watching stopped watching. I want to let you know, adults, if you thought that last Sunday's kids' ministry video or any of the kids' ministry videos we've had are not for you, you're missing out on something. Rob did, and just as others, Kelly and Casey, our other um, kids' gym leaders who have done videos, Rob did an excellent job uh, last week. I hope you'll go back to our, our website or to our Facebook page and find last Sunday's Cornerstone Virtual Sunday and watch the kids' ministry portion at the very end of that 
uh, of that service. Rob did a great job. It was funny. It was one of those basic stories that's really a, a basic bedrock faith story from the Bible. He did a great job, and it was really a, a message for people of all ages. You missed it. You missed a blessing if you didn't watch it. I hope you'll go back and do that. Well, I want to spend a few moments in prayer before we begin with our Bible study. By the way, we'll be looking in 1 John, as we have been for the last few weeks. We'll be in chapter 2, starting with verse 12 in just a, just a moment. But first, I want to mention some prayer concerns to you. Hope you'll be praying for Ward, who is recovering from surgery. Hope you'll be praying for Gerald, who still has um, a neck injury he's dealing with. Please pray for Craig. This is Jackie's son. Craig had surgery recently. Uh, Bob has asked us to pray for his sister who fell and had a surgery on her arm. Uh, hope you'll be praying for Lou's sister, Shirley, who fell recently. Also, we're remembering Lou's family because Lou's uncle, Gene, uh, died last week, and so we're, we're praying for them and their grief. Uh, we also remember Carol. Carol is, uh, is living in a different state right now during the pandemic. She's with family, but uh, we found out that her sister, Shirley, uh, just died a few days ago from the coronavirus. So, Cheryl, Carol, we are really sor sorry about uh, your sister's death, and we're praying for you. Hope you're praying for Mike, who's on staff, and not, not me, but another Mike's on staff and recovering from a surgery. He's doing well. I know he'd appreciate your prayers. And then I want to celebrate with, uh, with Lynn and with uh, Julie, who are recently, uh, or actually are going to be celebrating on uh, today. It's their anniversary, their 25th anniversary. Congratulations, Lynn and Julie. Julie, you're doing a great job. I think 25 more years and Lynn may really shape up into a fine husband. So great uh, for, for both of you. Well, let me ask you to join me as we begin our time. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you bring us together. And as we remember these who we've mentioned who are recovering from surgeries, or have dealt with injuries and illnesses, or are grieving loss. We pray that you'd be with each of them, that as a great physician, you would heal. As a comforter, you would be there walking side by side with them. And as one who cares for your creation, you would be with each of the families as well, knowing that you're with them and that you're helping them. We're grateful for the anniversary celebration for Lynn and Julie. Thank you for the way they are a blessing and you're blessing them. We pray that you would continue to bless their family. And now, God, as we read the scriptures today, make these words from 2,000 years ago come to life and make them as relevant today as, as if they were first written for us. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so 1 John chapter 2. I want to say a little bit about 1 John before we get into the scripture. So 1 John is a letter. It's part of a group of writings in the New Testament that are attributed to John, the disciple of Jesus, who writes the Gospel of John, letters of John, and then also the Revelation of John. And this letter, like any letter, has a context that it, it relates to and that it comes from. Like with any letter, there's always someone writing and someone receiving. We understand in any letter that there is a, a conversation going on before the letter's written, things that are happening, a relationship that's developed, and First John is no different. The people who receive this letter are part of a church, and they're living in a time that's around the end of the first century, so 85 to, say, 100 or 105 uh, AD, and so they're living in a time of real significant transition for Christians and for Jews and for people in the Mediterranean. And First John wishes to continue a conversation that the author, that John, has been having with these early Christians. I think there may be some things about this letter that really relate to our time and to our context. It really seems to me that we are living in a significant time of transition, even if it's not a permanent time of living with the coronavirus COVID-19 for 50 or 100 years. We hope it's only for a short amount of time that it's the kind of threat to us that it is now. But at any rate, we are living in a time where technology and the ways we can relate to each other through distance opportunities and virtual ministry can radically change the way church is understood 
and practiced and the way we can be influenced by others in a positive way through, uh, through Christian faith. I think that kind of radical shift in the world is something that was happening, not the details are the same, but the, the radical shift was happening in the first century too. I'll get to that in, in just a minute. But what I want to think about for just a moment is how a letter intends to say something that makes a real difference in the lives of the people who first heard it. And so it's, to me, important to understand what that world was like that First John was written in and that we can gather from the writings something about what was going on that led to the letter needing to be written. And then maybe understand how we can relate to that world even as that world has a message that can really be timeless for us. So uh, the letter to First John in First John, it begins by talking about a kind of expectation of, of who we are as people of, of the church, people of God, people who follow Christ, and how we are ones who are called to the light, to live in the light, and to understand that Christ uh, shines a light on the darkness and pulls us out of the darkness. And then in uh, verse 12 of chapter 2, there are a couple of verses that change uh, the tone and shift a little bit in terms of their focus. I'm going to read tonight from the New International Version, and it's probably a translation that if I was going to be more technical, w would not be the best translation because it doesn't pick, on, pick up on some of the, the nuances of translation. But I'm not really going to focus on those nuances today. I want to gather... Uh, something of the general tone that these verses bring to us. So 1 John 2 verses 12 through 14 say this, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name, meaning Christ's name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know Christ, who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you're strong and the word of God lives in you and you've overcome the evil one. These verses, according to some of the experts in New Testament, 1 John studies, the experts say these verses are kind of strange, especially looking at the way the first chapter and the rest of the second chapter of 1 John are written. It's almost like these verses don't fit with anything else that's going on there. Well, to me, I think they have an important purpose, regardless of how we might describe their fit in the overall structure of the letter. These verses are words that wish to inspire and encourage the first Christians who read it. Again, it's a church that's receiving this, uh, this letter of First John. And just like our church or any church in the New Testament world or in this world we live in now, there are times when we need to be encouraged. And so 1 John 2, 12 and following are words that are encouraging these early Christians, this early Christian church, to remember where they've come from, what God has done for them and is doing for them, and how they have, through faith in Christ, grown in their faith and overcome, and how there is strength in them that helps them to live better by faith. Again, the scripture begins by talking about how their sins have been forgiven because they have trusted in the name of Jesus Christ. This is meant to help them understand that they've been freed from something that was keeping them captive, uh, holding them down spiritually, uh, destroying relationships they might have had with others. Then the verse goes on to talk about how their trust in God is a trust that's really connected to a very ancient faith that's going back for generations and generations. And this faith has helped them to overcome all the evil that wishes to destroy their life, destroy their faith, and, and take away their hope. Then it goes on to just encourage them again to understand how trusting in God, the one who has been there from the beginning and continues to be there, is, this, is the, the kind of trust that builds strength, and strength helps to endure. But it's all because of God's word living inside of the Christians that were receiving this letter that reminds them that they'll be able to overcome the evil that threatens them. 
in a time like this where we experience threat, where we, we wonder, will life ever be the same? Will we be able to continue to do things that we've always loved to do? Or how will we be able to creatively create a new way of life in the midst of the threats of this pandemic? The scriptures speak to the church today just as the scriptures spoke to the church 2,000 years ago and says to us that our faith is transforming us spiritually and that gives us the strength to figure out how to work with God to creatively create new opportunities for ministry and new ways to support each other in, in our life by overcoming the evil that threatens us. The exterior evil that we had nothing to do with, that we didn't create, but that's overwhelming our society, challenging us every day. It also reminds us that the internal battles we face and the relationship battles that oftentimes become heightened and more prevalent because of the stresses of staying at home so much, that none of that can be too much for God to help us handle. So these verses are meant to be encouraging to us. To me, it's really helpful to hear these verses. I think that there were a couple of things that were threatening the people of the early church that this letter of 1 John is trying to address. First, there was a, a group of folks who were pseudo-Christians who were radically trying to shape the gospel and the church in ways that the earliest followers of Christ disagreed with. And so this letter is working to keep the church that received it, to keep that church focused on the basics of faith. But a second thing was happening in the late first century that would have radically affected the people who followed Christ. And that is that early Christians, most of whom were Jews and many of the converts to Christianity, first worshipped in two places. They worshipped in the synagogue that was in their local community, they might have worshipped at the temple if they lived in Jerusalem, but they also worshipped in homes. And the combination of synagogue and home worship was crucial to the life of the earliest church. So for a couple of decades at least, the early church uh, of Christians was, was going to a synagogue and worshipping at the synagogue. And then also having a meal at the home of fellow Christians and having worship time there as well. That's how the church looked in those first decades after Christ's resurrection. The letter of 1 John is written during the time when Christians were beginning to be pushed out of the synagogue, out of the, the home, spiritually speaking, they, that they thought they would always have. And so in the late first century, 1 John is written during a time of tremendous turmoil, tension, and transition for the early Christians. They're figuring out how do we do what we're called to do, which is follow Christ, and yet we aren't going to be able to be in the house of worship, the synagogue or the temple in Jerusalem that we believe we should be in. It was a really discombobulating, frustrating, fearful time for early Christians. And the, the New Testament, a lot of it is writing to try and help the early Christians understand that as this shift away from synagogue worship is happening, that the church is, be, is forming a new identity as people of God who don't need to be in a particular place in order to be God's children, Christ's followers, and what is becoming the church. For us today, there is a real challenge on our parts to figure out how to be the church without being in a physical building together. Now, this isn't new, by the way. There have been churches that have been started that are completely virtual, that never have a physical building or use a physical building very little. And the vast majority of what's done is done on virtual space, so to speak, through the ministries we're now doing. And I mean, the intention of virtual ministry is just to help people understand that even if we can't be together physically because we might threaten each other with a, a deadly virus, that we're still the church, and that virtual ministry, phone tree ministry, are ways to continue to be the church. In 1 John 2.12, I think the, the writer is saying to the earliest Christians, 
be encouraged. You are the church. You're doing well. You're overcoming all the, overcoming all the challenges that you face. Maybe one of those challenges was they were losing their home place of worship, the synagogue that they expected to be in for all of their life. For us, it's important for us to see that there are new avenues of ministry opening up to us through this virtual ministry uh, paradigm. And so at Cornerstone, since we've been around since 1807, we've always adapted. There's a reason we have been in five different locations, that we've had five different names, that we've had seven different buildings. Whether it's been shifting uh, communities, uh, population communities, it's been natural disasters or wars, or it's just simply outgrowing a space or a shifting culture and a different kind of context for ministry. We have moved and rebuilt and renamed in order to be relevant to the people we're called to. Now, during this time of uh, pandemic, we've been forced to embrace a technology that has been growing for over two decades. And this virtual ministry is going to be a crucial part of the next decades of ministry that Cornerstone does. I remember when I was fresh out of seminary in the mid-90s, going to an innovative church conference just months after graduating from seminary. I may not have even been ordained yet at the time. I remember watching this famous preacher from the West Coast stand in front of us at this large hotel in the Washington, D.C. area, and he preached from a laptop computer. Man, in 1994, that was crazy. We had never seen anything like it. And I learned in that conference back in 94 that there was something called email. And I remember talking to the pastor who I served with. I said, I think we should get email. And he said, uh, what would we do with that? I said, I have no idea. And he said, I'm not going to do it. A year later, he came to me and he said, we're going to get some email because I've got some ideas. What we discovered was that the, the government organizations, the government employees, the government entities in the Washington, D.C. area were using email to get work done. And it became a way for us to, to in, increase our ministry communication with our church members by using email. We could communicate all different kinds of ways, everything from uh, basic business to do ministries to uh, personal concerns. That technology that was really taking shape in the, the mid-90s and then the internet that was also beginning to blossom and connect to people in their homes became something that was uh, a, a new tool for ministry. I can remember in 97, moving to another church in Richmond, Virginia, getting email for the church. And for a year, people wondered, why do we have email? And it slowly became a crucial part of ministry for us. We're in a time now where churches have been using virtual ministry platforms, social media, and different kinds of streaming ministries and different ways of posting ministry content into virtual ministry spaces that have radically expanded ministry. We just haven't had to do that before at Cornerstone, but now we get a chance to. I think the words from 1 John 2, 12 should encourage us to let us know that the God we've trusted in since 1807, the forefathers and foremothers that we, whose shoulders and legacies support us now, push us forward to really uh, dramatically improve and increase how much virtual ministry we offer to the world. It radically changes how we can communicate to each other and to reach out to each other. At the same time, 1 John 2.12 not only speaks to us about the radically changing world we live in and how just like 2,000 years ago, the early church was going to be okay even though the synagogue was not going to be their place of worship anymore. And today for us, as we're struggling to figure out how to get back into building ministry, we have this new ministry approach or paradigm that's going to become a regular part of ministry for the foreseeable future, for decades to come most likely. There's also another aspect of ministry that 1 John 2 reminds us of, and that is the support of God to, to the people of God or children of God and the support of children of God to each other. Again, this book is a letter written to encourage in part the early church that received it. And so as 1 John 2, 12 through 14 was first being read and then reread and reread by the church that first got this, this letter, it built them up and encouraged them and reminded them of their important relationship to each other 
just as they're supported by the author of 1 John, they were encouraged to be supporting each other. I hope today that you'll be thinking about how you can be a support to other Christians at Cornerstone and in your life. You may not be a part of Cornerstone's uh, brick and mortar ministry. Maybe you've connected to us through the virtual ministry world we've got, but you still have people that you know that maybe aren't part of Cornerstone, or maybe they are, but you haven't really been able to see them, to talk to them, to shake hands with them, to have lunch or dinner with them because you're confined to your house. Take a moment and think about those people that you really care about and spend this week in, in figuring out how you can write a letter, you can make a phone call, you can send an email, you can maybe send a gift to them. Reach out to someone who you know is isolated and connect to them in a way that matters to them and will matter to you too. We've developed a phone tree ministry that each week allows for everyone in Cornerstone who wants to to be contacted by someone in the church to be able to just talk for a few minutes and share prayer concerns. I really appreciate the phone tree leaders who are making those phone calls every week and collecting information and staying connected to each other. But really, that's not meant to be the only way that we connect to each other. It's just supposed to be a basic foundational part of our ministry during this uh, time of pandemic. I hope you'll consider how you can do things whether it's create a new ministry that's in some way uh, building on phone tree ministry or uh, some kind of uh, virtual conversation with people or a small group that doesn't meet in a physical place but meets in some kind of video conferencing platform. Or maybe you're just taking up the phone and calling some folks and saying hi to them or you're writing a note to people. Think about how you can be supporting each other uh, this week in a way that's really going to make a difference. The letter that was written to the people of the church that, that got First John first needed to hear from the writer of First John. They needed that support. And so the scripture is encouraging us, informing us, and teaching us to do the same, especially during a time like this. Well, then the scripture goes on in verses uh, 15 through 17 to say these words. It says, uh, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is one of those themes that's in the writings of John, especially in 1 John and the other letters of John, that creates a... Uh, a, a contrasting world or a contrasting way of understanding life and faith. The contrast or the dichotomy is between um, following uh, Christ, being faithful to God, and choosing God's way of life, and loving the world, and loving the things of this temporary existence, and loving the, the things that that aren't eternal, but are temporary. And the challenge that the scripture gives to us today is to, to understand that our citizenship, as we say yes to God through Christ, is eternal in nature. That there are things in the world that are temporary, that are passing away, that we can put too much emphasis on. We can love too much. And our faith can actually be uh, hindered when our love for things that are temporary outweigh our love for God. And so the scripture for today is speaking to us about that challenge. You know, we encounter that challenge as we think about what it's like to be the church right now. There's always a challenge to figure out just how much we should love the buildings and the property that our churches are on. Every church I've ever been in, and I've been in church my, literally my entire life, every church I've been in has had a building or buildings that relied on the generous support and literally the sweat equity of generations of Christians to build the building, keep the building uh, up, kept up, and to support the ministries of the church. When we put that much 
into something we can see when we give so much of ourself to the brick and mortar of the church, it becomes valuable to us. It becomes ours in some way. But the problem with that is that, just like I was saying a minute ago, since the very earliest days of the church, especially in 1 John, during that time around the last 20 years of the first century, Christians were beginning to realize their identity was not what they thought it was, that it's not about a particular building like the synagogue, but it's about being completely and totally loyal and dedicated to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so the leadership of God's Spirit is to guide us away from putting too much stock in and too much love in the physical representations of being the people of God and putting more and more stock in the relationships we form with one another. So the challenge is to see that our eternal relationship with God is meant to be duplicated in our relationships with people in this world, that we have one foot squarely in eternity, but the other foot's standing right in this world in this temporary time and place. And so the importance is for us to be able to say we're going to love God with all of who we are and understand that, that things of this world change and transition. You know, I have to tell you, one of the biggest challenges we face as we decide not to put too much pride in our life but turn our pride over to God is to understand how to live out the general rules that John Wesley gave to the earliest Methodists it's a way of life that Methodists like us at Cornerstone are called to live every day. We're taught that being a Christian should begin with the, the dedicated effort to do no harm. And then as we seek to do no harm, we also in the same way seek to do good by allowing God to work in and through us. In order to do no harm and do good, it means we have to learn how to stay in love and grow in love with God every day through worship and scripture study and prayer and the receiving of communion and the practice of service for others in ministry. And so our efforts to do no harm are more important than us continuing to perpetuate traditions that are temporary. Let me give you an example. So one of the things that I have found to be a challenge for me is the idea that I should be wearing a face mask when I'm out in public. I mean, I tell you, I, I forgot to, I was washing my face mask, but I've got a great Cardinals face mask. And I tell you, um, it, it looks great. It's very fashionable, but you know, it's a face mask. But then I heard that if I put that face mask on, that I have the potential to protect other people from the coronavirus if I happen to have the coronavirus. Now you say, like, you know, I've said, well, I don't have it. Only problem is we never know when we've picked it up. Have you ever realized, have you realized this week or this month or the last few months, how often you touch your, your eyes, your nose, your mouth? Like, I never thought about it before. But now I think about it all the time. Every time I'm on a video, video conference or I'm doing one of these Wednesday Bible studies, I'm really thinking about, okay, don't put my hands to my face because I'm not supposed to do that now. In the same way, I realize that because we, I do touch my face, it's possible for me to touch something that has a coronavirus on it and then touch my face. And because of the way this virus works, it'd be possible for me to walk around during some kind of uh, gathering where I'm the pastor or something and infect a lot of other people. I would hate to do something like that. In fact, that's happened a lot in the last uh, three months where people in church, pastors, have infected other people unknowingly, unintentionally. And so I I've really come around to thinking that wearing a face mask is a crucial thing that I need to do in order to represent the, the Christian desire to do no harm. In order to be faithful to God, I think I need to be wearing a face mask as much as possible. When we start moving back into in-person worship in the building in confined spaces, we're going to have to adjust the traditions we have when we get together. You know, the traditions we've generally had at Cornerstone and in so many other churches around the country is that when the church gets together, people shake hands, people hug, 
people stand close and talk to each other, people don't wear face masks, uh, people sit close together, and people spend lots of time together, even having coffee, donuts, and, and spending sometimes upwards of two hours together between fellowship and gathering time and worship time. And I know we have to adjust that when we move back into the building. So uh, I've been thinking, how, how does the scripture speak to it? Well, 1 John 2, 15 through 17 tells us that the world and the desires that are very much of this world, like how we should relate to each other, those pass away. But the things that remain are the eternal gifts that God gives to us, the gifts of hope, peace, joy, and love, the gifts of the community of fellowship of the people of God, the promise of salvation that comes from a forgiveness of sins and, a, and just a, a receiving of God's grace and living that grace out. Those are the things that are eternal. Finding ways to continue to worship, in-person worship, and not harm each other, is crucial to what we'll do in the future. But it requires us to be willing to start by doing no harm to each other. You know, I have found too that as a pastor, I sometimes think the rules don't really apply to me, but they do to you. So when we come to church, I can go anywhere in the building, but you can't unless you have a key. There are other things too, like, um, you know, there are just times where I forget to tell our our administrative director, director of administration, that I'm going to go over to the building. We're doing that now. Every time someone goes to the building, we've asked them to let her know, to let Stacy know that they're going to be there. We're trying to make sure that we're not having overlapping people in the building too much, and there's plenty of uh, distance between folks. And every time I forget, I'm like, ah, oh, who cares? I'm the pastor. But, you know, that rule applies to me too. As we move forward in, um, in ministry together, I hope you'll realize that our intention is for us to continue to grow in faith, to live better by faith, and to support each other, even in the ways we have to adapt our ministry to the current time we live in. I'm telling you, for, for us, it's crucial for us to all be willing to agree to a set of new traditions. Something as simple as contacting the, the church administrative director before we go over to the building and saying, Hey, I'm going to go over to the building today. I just want to let you know, make sure it's okay. It's crucial. Wearing a face mask, even though we don't like it or we don't think it's really that important. But knowing that someone else, another Christian, will feel more comfortable, will feel embraced by us, and will embrace us. That's more important than our own pride in saying we can't get sick or this, this uh, face mask doesn't do that much good. It's just an example a very timely example of the ways the Bible wishes to be part of our life. There are so many ways that this scripture that calls us to, to not love the world, but to love God, to um, see that everybody in the world, all of the things that we wish for and that we want to grab it onto and that we have pride in are secondary to love for God. I mean, that's a very relevant message in so many ways and applies to so much of what we can do. I hope today that you know this, that you are deeply loved by other Christians at Cornerstone. Maybe you're not a regular at Cornerstone, but you wanna get more connected. Contact us at cornerstoneofallon.org and let us know that you want to be part of us. Maybe use this church Facebook page, our Cornerstone Facebook page, and, and send a, a message to us. Let us know you want to get more connected. Or maybe you're a regular at Cornerstone, but you realize this is the time for you to start making some, some next steps in faith. Contact me. Let me know what I can do to help you in those next steps of faith. Listen, we'll be talking in the next few weeks about the next steps of ministry I want you to understand that your church leadership and church staff are working very hard to figure out how to do safe in-person ministry. We're also in conversation with other Methodist churches in St. Charles County with uh, our bishop and district superintendent and with the health department of St. Charles County, making sure that we're following important guidelines, paying attention, of course, to what hospitals and nursing homes are allowing. Right now, they're still not allowing guests. So that's a, another way for us to be able to understand what we're supposed to be doing next. What we're thinking about, what's next for us, knowing that one of the things we'll want to do is be able to start ministering 
in person together in a way that's safe for us. 1 John chapter 2, written over to, almost 2,000 years ago, continues to be relevant to us today. I hope you'll go back and look at this scripture later and just see how it wishes to encourage you and challenge you to live better by faith. Listen, it's been great to spend this time together with you today. I hope you'll tell a friend, uh, either through virtual means or by calling them up or texting them, telling them about the Cornerstone Virtual Ministries, invite them to be part of the things we're doing in the coming days and weeks. So as I leave this time, blessings to you, and may you be a person who is living better by faith every day. I'll see you soon.